the first part of our strategy is to read the last part of the question and then go over the answer choices. But in this question, it's a little different. The last part of the question and the answer choices are actually on top. So we'll read that first. For each patient with knee pain, select the most appropriate next step in management. A, radionuclide bone scan. B, MRI of the affected knee. C, antibiotic therapy. D, NSAIDs. E, knee immobilization. And F, joint aspiration. So the reason why we read all this first is to focus our thinking so when we read the rest of the question, we can obtain a diagnosis more efficiently. Now we'll read the question. A 13-year-old boy is brought to the physician because of a three-month history of left knee pain that is exacerbated by vigorous exercise. He also has had occasional pain in his right knee. There is no history of trauma. He is the 50th percentile for height and weight. His temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Examination shows mild swelling and tenderness of the tibial tubercle on the left and range of motion of the knee is full. So before we get into the question, we have two strategies that we have to go over that we will teach you as a part of our course. The first strategy is if you do not know the diagnosis. For example, this question has a pretty difficult diagnosis. And if you don't know the diagnosis, we will give you a strategy that you can pick a correct answer choice by using the information given to you. The second strategy is one that you will have gained after a full course with us after doing all of the questions, homework assignments, and reading material that we assign to you, and repeating this strategy over and over again until you master it. And this strategy is going through the question, obtaining a diagnosis in your mind, and picking the correct answer to move on as efficiently and quickly as possible. So let's move on to the question now, the important points. It's a 13-year-old boy, so it's a young boy. This condition could just be affecting young children. A three-month history of left knee pain and right knee pain, so it's bilateral chronic pain exacerbated by vigorous exercise, no trauma, developmentally normal, afebrile, and only mild swelling and tenderness at the left tibial tubercle on exam, no effusion, no erythema, and no limitations of range of motion. So now let's move on to the answer choices. We're going through strategy one, so we're assuming we don't know the diagnosis here. So we have A, radionuclide bone scan. So we have to know what a radionuclide bone scan is. So the bone scan is detecting osteoblasts laying down osteoids, an increased amount of this. So examples of when this will be positive are in metastatic bone lesions and also if you have growth. And since this boy is 13 years old, a radionuclide bone scan will be positive because the boy will be growing and the, bone, the osteoblasts will be laying down osteoids. So a radionuclide bone scan would not help us with our diagnosis. There's no sign of cancer here as well for metastatic lesions. B, MRI of the affected knee. Doing an MRI is only if you have major structural damage to the ligaments or to the bones itself. So there's no history of trauma and there's just some mild swelling and tenderness. Doing an MRI would be very premature and is a very expensive test that is only warranted if you have a reason to order it. So if there's a limitation of range of motion, if there's any trauma, then that would be an, a reason to do it. But for now, that would be too excessive of a test. So we can cross out MRI. Antibiotic therapy. As you mentioned, patients afebrile, just mild swelling and tenderness, no effusion, and also no erythema. And this is three-month history, so most likely this is not an infection, so you can get rid of C. NSAIDs. Since this is a mild swelling and tenderness, three-month history of left knee pain, exacerbated by exercise, this could be just from chronic use. So let's hold on to NSAIDs because that would decrease inflammation going on with the knee. And it re relieves pain as well, which is a major symptom with this, with this boy. Knee immobilization E. This is only done before, to keep the knee stable before surgery or for athletes. And this patient's knee is not going to have any history of trauma. It doesn't look like there's any major structural damage. And having some tenderness and swelling of the tibial tubercle is not a reason to immobilize the knee. And finally, joint aspiration. You only do a joint aspiration when you're looking for gout, pseudogout, uh, septic arthritis, or other conditions where there's an effusion present but there's only mild swelling, so it's not enough for a joint aspirate. So our best answer is D, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug therapy. With our other strategy, you'd be able to determine that the diagnosis here is osgood schlatter disease, which is caused by excessive jumping and activity in a, young, in a child, in an adolescence, in a boy or a girl, say it's a basketball player or a gymnast, and the treatment for this would be NSAIDs and rest because of the inflammation associated. And the reason why the osgood schlatter disease causes damage to the left tibial tubercle is because the patellar tendon inserts onto the left tibial tubercle and the repetitive use causes 
is swelling and inflammation and tenderness of the patellar tendon and the tibial tubercle itself. We'll start with the first part of our strategy by reading the end of the question and the answer choices. Which of the following is the most likely location of the primary disease process? A, the adrenal gland, B, the bone marrow, C, the CNS, D, the kidney, E, the liver, F, muscle, G, pancreas, H, parathyroid gland, I, pituitary gland, and J, thyroid gland. So now let's go to the question itself. A 17-year-old girl comes to the physician because of fatigue, increased thirst, and increased urination over the past two weeks. She has had a 4.5 kilogram weight loss during this period despite an increased appetite. She has not had dysuria. At the onset of her symptoms, she had a mild upper respiratory tract infection that resolved without treatment. Her temperature is 36.8 degrees Celsius, pulse is 86, respiration 14, and blood pressure 100 over 50. Cranial nerves are intact. Muscle strength 5 out of 5, and deep tendon reflexes are symmetric. Serum studies show the below findings. So, once again, we have two strategies that we can go to. One, if you know what the diagnosis is, which you will after our course, you can go find the conclusion, find out what the diagnosis is, and figure out the answer based on the evidence above. But if you don't know the diagnosis, and this question of diagnosis is very difficult, we will go through the information in the passage itself and then rule out answers until we come up with only one. So now let's find the important aspects of the question passage. There's a 17-year-old girl, so she's young, and this condition probably affects younger people. Fatigue, increased thirst, and increased urination, so that tells us some symptoms. She's also had weight loss despite an increased appetite. Not many things cause this, so this is a very key finding. She has not had dysuria, and she had a mild upper respiratory tract infection that resolved without treatment. So since they said this happened at the onset of her symptoms, this is a very relevant URI. A febrile. Everything else is okay, but the blood pressure is a little low, the diastolic number is concerning. Cranial nerves are intact, muscle strength is 5 out of 5, and DTR is symmetric. Of the lab studies, sodium is low, chloride is low, potassium is borderline normal to low, bicarbonate is a little high, and the creatinine is elevated for a 17-year-old girl. So now let's go through the answer choices to figure out which one is most correct. So let's start with the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland has an outer cortex and an inner medulla. And Based on the information given above, the most likely medulla and epinephrine and norepinephrine is not involved. Most likely testosterone and, and uh, DHEA and androstenedione and down are not involved. And most likely it's cortisol or aldosterone that play an important role here. So if the patient had an Addison's-like disease, that would explain the fatigue. It could explain the weight loss. However, it does not explain the increased appetite and increased urination. So therefore, it likely is an Addison's disease. And also, Addison's disease and, uh, would not affect the kidney and cause an elevated creatinine. So therefore, we can get rid of A, the adrenal gland. And also, in Addison's disease, you have an elevated potassium because you lose the mineralic corticoid effect. Letter B, bone marrow. There's nothing here that identifies any issues with the blood, red blood cells, white blood cells. So therefore, the bone marrow most likely is not the problem. There's no sign of anemia and no sign of any kind of infection except for the upper respiratory tract infection, which has already resolved. Central nervous system, they already say that the cranial nerves are intact and the deep tendon reflexes are symmetric, so the CNS is probably not correct. Now for letter D, the kidney. The kidney could be a major issue here because look at all these electrolyte abnormalities. However, the weight loss is by an increased appetite kind of goes away from the kidney disease. But there's something called diabetes insipidus, which theoretically could answer this question because of the increased thirst, increased urination, but the increased appetite does not fit, and diabetes and does not usually occur after an upper respiratory tract infection, okay? And the sodium, if you're dehydrated, would usually be high. E, the liver, so that's where you can cross out D. Now with E, the liver, the liver can cause some renal disease by hepatorenal syndrome when there's liver cirrhosis, but there are no other signs of liver cirrhosis anywhere here, and the liver would not be involved in increased thirst and increased urination. Next, the muscle. The muscle is the most obvious one that we can rule out. The muscle strength is normal, cranial nerves intact, deep tendon reflex is symmetric. Therefore, most likely there's not a muscle problem causing increased thirst and increased urination and an increased appetite. Now the pancreas. The pancreas is an important organ because it actually has exocrine and endocrine functions, which you must remember. This likely isn't affecting the exocrine function of the pancreas 
because there's no mention of any digestive tract abnormalities. But the endocrine function involves insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. And this actually could play a role. If you think about insulin, a lack of insulin could present like this. For example, a type 1 diabetes can present with a DKA on presentation with a mild URI that results in increased thirst, increased urination, fatigue, and increased appetite and weight loss. And also, you have a pseudo-hyponatremia from the elevated glucose. And notice how they don't give you a glucose level because they don't want to give the answer away. And also, the creatinine is elevated due to dehydration from the diuresis from glucose. So we'll hold on to pancreas. The parathyroid gland, there's no mention of calcium, and calcium would most likely could cause an increased thirst and increased uh, urination, but it would not cause an increased appetite or any weight loss. And also, it most likely would not be triggered by a multi mild upper respiratory tract infection. In addition, if there's an abnormality with calcium, the deep tendon reflexes and the muscle strength would be affected as well. Now the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, as we mentioned, it could be de de defective, and this could affect both the TSH and the ACTH. But as we mentioned before, this does not fit the symptoms of a cortisol deficiency, because a cortisol deficiency would have an elevated potassium, so we can rule out the ACTH factor, and a TSH, this isn't a hypothyroid state, so this is a fatigue here, it talks about hypothyroid, but an increased appetite rules out a hypothyroid state. So likely a hypofunction of pituitary gland is not the problem here. Finally, the thyroid gland. A hyperthyroidism could present like this with the weight loss and increased appetite, but it doesn't explain the increased thirst and increased urination, and it also doesn't affect the damage to the kidney. So as a result, the pancreas is the best option for us, and G is the correct answer. Now, if you had done our strategy, this question would have been a lot simpler and you can jump right to the conclusion instead of spending a lot of time going through each and every individual answer choice. We'll start this question like we have before by reading the end of the question and the answer choices. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for the patient's urinary incontinence? A. Bladder neck dyssynergia. B. Chronic bladder inflammation. C. Detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. D. Failure of bladder neck closure and E, failure to inhibit the voiding reflex. So the reason why we do this, to reiterate, is to focus our minds onto what we're looking for as we're reading the rest of the question. So now let's read the rest of the question. A 72-year-old man is brought to the physician by his wife because of a six-month history of difficulty walking, cognitive decline, and urinary incontinence. He has not had dysuria or nocturia. His wife says that his short-term memory has decreased and he has had intermittent confusion. On exam, he has a broad-based, short-stepped gait with some reduction of step height. He is oriented to person and place, but not to time. He learns four words with some difficulty and recalls zero after three minutes. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for the patient's urinary incontinence? So remember, what we're going to do first is we're going to go through the question and go over the main points that are going to lead us to our diagnosis. First is a 17-year-old man, so this is an elderly man. Six-month history, so it's cr pretty chronic. Difficulty walking, cognitive decline, and urinary incontinence. So we have three major symptoms here. No dysuria or nocturia. The major problems with cognitive decline are short-term memory and confusion. The difficulty walking is a broad-based, short-stepped gait. And he is oriented to person and place, but not the time. And this further reiterates the short-term memory loss. So. Once again, we have our two strategies that we're going to teach you as part of our course. The first strategy is if we have a question where we don't know anything about the answer and we cannot find the diagnosis, then we go through the process of elimination strategy. The second strategy is what we will learn after we have gone through a full course together and you've learned all the material we want you to know through questions and reading, and you can come up with a diagnosis and get an answer much more efficiently. Let's go over the first method. So. We're going to start with bladder neck dyssynergia. If you notice that bladder neck dyssynergia is actually really similar to detrusor sphincter dyssynergia because to maintain continence of urine, the detrusor muscle of the bladder needs to be relaxed while the neck and the sphincter of the bladder need to be contracted. So dyssynergia would cause incontinence because the detrusor muscle would be contracting while the neck and the sphincter would be relaxing. But as you can tell, A and C are very similar answer choices. And because of that, you can cross them both out because they both can't be right. And 
neither of these will specifically answer the question because the patient's problem is actually having neurologic deficits and a urinary incontinence associated, and it wouldn't be specific enough to be only the bladder neck or only the detrusor sphincter. So we can get rid of A and C. Now we have the chronic bladder inflammation. There's no dysuria or nocturia, and chronic UTIs and interstitial cystitis and other bladder inflammations will have some kind of discomfort with urination. So B can be eliminated as well. Now we have D, failure of bladder neck closure. As we mentioned before, maintaining continence is by having the bladder neck and the sphincter contracted and the detrusor muscle relaxed. With only the bladder neck failing to close, the sphincter will still be closed and the detrusor muscle may still be relaxed. So just by the failure of bladder neck closure will not cause incontinence. You need a sequence of events causing bladder, detrusor bladder muscle contraction, bladder neck relaxation, and also sphincter relaxation. So answer D is a very incomplete answer choice. That leaves us with E. And does this answer choice make sense? Yes, it does, because this patient is having difficulty with memory, he's having confusion, and as a result, he may not always inhibit his voiding reflex when he feels the need to void, and therefore he'll have incontinence for that reason.